last session of um, papers for LCA. Um, we're now going to hear from Molly de Blanc, who is Campaigns Manager at the Free Software Foundation and on the Board of Directors of the Open Source Initiative, which she says makes her legit. Um, <laughs> I understand that she also likes hanging out with her cat and playing bassoon, and she is here to talk to us about measuring free software. Cool. Hi, I'm Molly. Uh, I guess that was just said. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank everyone for coming this far away from the main room. Um, there's some information about me, including my name and the FSF logo. It's very pretty looking. Um, so why am I here and why are you here? Well, I'm here because I love community and I love free software. Um, and I think that in order to live in this beautiful world where we can have technology that we trust, we have to have good, strong communities in order to build good, strong, free software. Um, oh, I heard it. Mm -hmm, that's good. <laughs> um, and we can't have a world with this great technology if we don't have people making it. One of the things that we need in order to make great technology is not just great communities, but we need those communities to be inclusive, we need them to be welcoming, and we need them to be places where we can get everyone to show up to build these wonderful things. Statistically speaking, I'm going to say that a lot, uh, free software is made by volunteers. There are plenty of people who get, made to pay, who get paid to make free software, but a lot of the stuff that we talk about and we think about when we're talking about free software is done by volunteers. Um, and we have intuitions about who's doing this work. Uh, I got interested in this because there are a lot of these like community manager common knowledge points uh, that I've never seen any actual data on. Um, so I wanted to kind of see what had been done about that and, and how much of it was really true. So this is our intuition of what people don't look like when they make free software. I mean, look at how well those women are dressed. <laughs> I've never seen a hacker dress that well. Um, so why? Why does our intuition say that's not the case? Right? So uh, equity and equality. Um, these are two really important topics that don't necessarily tie so much into when we're talking about the numbers, but they're an important thing to understand when we're talking about the numbers. This is the difference between equality and equity. Equality is the idea that we're going to give everyone the same thing. And this is an idea that we embrace a lot, actually. Like, we think that if we provide the space for people to show up, they will show up. We expect that once they're here, they'll contribute, and that the tools we have and the documentation we have is enough for everyone. Uh, it turns out this isn't the case. Um, and also that what we need to do is we need to think about equity. Equity is the understanding that everybody has different hurdles and everyone is coming from different places. I like this picture a lot um, in terms of demonstrating equity and equality because not only are people starting from different places, but the bar that they have to reach to see over the fence, this is a photo of some people standing at a fence, um, is much higher uh, for some of us rather than others. So when we're thinking about what it means when we see how communities are built and who's showing up, we also need to think about where they're coming from or where they might be coming from and how we can compensate for that in order to allow them all to participate at the same level. Uh, here are some more things about me that might be useful to know. Uh, here's a list of things I'm not. <laughs> I'm not trained in business theory or demography, diversity, economics, sociology, statistics, or really anything relevant to this discussion. <laughs> I'm also not somebody who makes dynamic slides, so there'll be a lot of text. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to be good and read as much of it as I can in case anyone in here has some vision difficulty. Um, however, there are some things I have done. I have a degree in philosophy. It's about the same thing uh, as <laughs> statistics. Uh, I've been doing stuff in free software for 10 years. I'm so glad I get to kick off my 10th year of free software contribution at LCA. Thank you so much. Uh, I installed R in the appropriate CRAN libraries in Debian, uh, and I can help you with that because it's really difficult. Uh, I've made some really boring slides, and I did pass an introductory to, introductory to statistics course, so I know a few things about p-values. Um, I've also run a few surveys, and, and then I wrote this list in alphabetical order. <laughs> um, so here's some stuff about my methodology. Uh, I realize that people aren't persuaded by facts. This is, this is a fairly well-studied phenomenon. People are persuaded by stories. They're persuaded by their own experiences. I, however, am persuaded by facts, and I know that puts me in a minority. Um, so I wanted to you know, see what these facts actually looked like. 
Here are some questions that I came up with. Who is contributing to free software? Who considers themselves a part of the free software community? What are people doing? Where are their overlapping activities? By which I mean, where is there a place where somebody is contributing code and also doing administrative work? That kind of became the focus of a lot of what I was looking at. Um, and does this mean anything? Like, does, does that really matter? Who's doing what? Um, and then I also realized as I was looking through this, are surveys valuable tools? Um, and that's a really good question we need to be asking ourselves, especially as we're thinking more about things like floss metrics and we're like, well, how do we measure contributions? How do we know what's valuable? Um, so I wanted to focus on contribution types and age gender demographics when I was looking at survey work that other people had done. Um, a lot of other things that I saw were really interesting. Uh, there are some really cool facts about marriage, um, which is also a personal statistical interest of mine uh, that I'm happy to talk about later. Um, but we probably won't have time. Um, so here are some studies that have been done that I found. There was one from 2002, one from 2003. Then there was a big jump until 2013. Um, in 2016, there was one, a disclaimer, I helped run the Debian Community Survey, so I think it's the best one. Um, and then GitHub also did an open source survey in 2017. Um, the Free Libre Open Source Software Survey and Study by the University of Maastricht in 2002 uh, it's available online as a PDF. That, that report contains aggregated data. So I couldn't look at who specifically was doing which thing, but instead how many people were working on different kinds of things and how many people fit into each demographic category. Uh, this is kind of what that looks like. It's good style work. Um, and this particular uh, bar graph here is, demonstrates what types of projects people are working on. It turns out a lot of people are doing networking things. Uh, and not a lot of people were making wireless applications back in 2002. Um, then there was also the universe, uh, Stanford University's Free Libre Open Source Software Open Source Survey. Uh, that's available online still as a web page that was designed in 2003, uh, and it contains aggregated data. This is what the survey looks like, slash this is what 2003 looked like. <laughs> and this is what their data looked like. Um, I think this is great because it's awful. <laughs> Um, it's really interesting uh, how they presented it and how they chose to do it, and I understand that's what they were working with at the time, um, but it wasn't the easiest to work with if just because uh, I could not copy and paste it into a CSV file easily, so I got to do a lot of typing. This is also what some of their question results pages looked like. They were less helpful. This is an object not found page. Um, so if anyone from Stanford ever listens to this, please, can you, can you share the rest of those? Um, uh, in 2003, 2000, uh, 2013, this one is really interesting, and I'll get to that soon, why this one is so cool or strange. Um, this was done by the Universi Universidad Rey, the Universidad Politecnica, and TU Eindhoven. Um, I couldn't find aggregated data um, or raw pages, but the individual reports did contain aggregated data. I asked uh, some people about it, and they directed me to web pages that weren't loading. Um, and then there was the Debian one. Aggregated data for that is available if anyone is interested in it. Um, I secretly or not so secretly have access to the raw data. Um, I tried, I did some stuff with that, but mostly I tried to work from the aggregated because I wanted to be going at it from the same place that any other indiv like, you know, independent researcher would be looking at this stuff from. Uh, and then there's GitHub who has the raw data available, which is really great for me and really horrible for everyone who filled out the survey. Uh, because it's really easy to de-anonymize data, especially when you're working with a closed set, i.e. people who have GitHub accounts. Um, so this all, this all means a few different things. Um, and like the data itself means a few different things. So one of the things to ask is who is making free software um, and what can we learn from them? This is my cat. He's a really hardcore free software hacker. Uh, he's great, big fan. Um, so now, now we're going to talk about why that 2013 survey, uh, 20, yeah, 2013 survey was really interesting. Um, this is a breakdown of respondents by gender. Um, so you see, arguably, steadily over time, it makes sense that you're seeing 
more women contributing to free software projects. Um, in fact, also 2013, what made that year really unique, it was the first time they asked what kind of not, like who out there is identifying as non-binary, what non-binary folks are contributing to free software. 2013 is also interesting because you'll notice there's a huge number of women respondents. How did that happen? Well, it turns out it happened because the people conducting the survey had included outreachy alum and people who'd been participating in that program who went out and talked to all their outreachy alum friends. They reached out to Debbie and women. They reached out to these groups of people who weren't responding to the other surveys. In fact, more women responded to that survey than women responded to all of the other surveys combined. And I know, like, anecdotally, that several women who responded to that survey did not respond to other ones. Uh, so what this teaches us is that surveys are really bad, actually. Uh, one of the things we want to do in general when we're doing survey work is we want to have a list of possible respondents. This is why the Debian survey, I think, is very interesting. Um, because there was, there was a closed set of people who were being asked to fill it out, which was every Debian developer. Um, it turns out that not only did all the Debian developers, or most of them, respond, but so did other people, uh, including contributors, maintainers, and users. Uh, which I guess in some way makes it a slightly skewed set. When you give an open call out for data and for survey respondents, you do get a lot of responses if you're lucky, but you don't actually get them from the people who are underrepresented in the community otherwise, or you get fewer responses from those people. It turns out imposter syndrome extends to, being, to, to saying whether or not you have imposter syndrome or whether or not you're even just a user and showing up. Not that anyone is just a user. Being a user of free software is super cool and super hardcore. Thank you. Um, so there's also variations in age groupings about how people were aggregating their age data. Um, so if you look at Stanford, they had their, this is Stanford, oh, yeah, it's a pointer. Um, there were, the way that they grouped the ages of respondents um, was uh, smaller than the categories GitHub was putting people into. Uh, Stanford's age number is particularly interesting because they didn't actually ask anyone how old they were. They asked them the age, their age at their first contribution, and then later on they asked them how long they'd been contributing to free and open source software. Um, so that's where those numbers came from. GitHub actually just went out and asked people kind of what age category that they fit into. Uh, something you'll notice uh, in this is that in 2013, uh, the 21 to 25 age category had the highest number of people in it. Um, but then in 2017, the 25 to 34 age category had the highest number of people in it, uh, which either means an older crowd is showing up or we're just all aging. <laughs> Thank you. Um, here's a, a contributor age comparison between Debian and GitHub. Now this one I think is particularly interesting because Debian is a smaller project. And it's like a specific project, whereas GitHub is, in theory, everyone and everything that's on GitHub. Uh, Debian, it turns out, skews a little bit older than other groups. The actual median age of a Debian contributor, at least in 2016, was 39. It might be 40 now. Um, and with GitHub, you're seeing more people in the 25 to 34 range. OK, so now that we have this idea that there are, at least responding to surveys, a lot of men, we're seeing people these days, like back in the day, people who were in their 20s, and now we're seeing more people in their 30s. Like, so what are they do actually doing? Um, and what I wanted to find out from that is, what's the normal division of labor? Like, what are these people doing, and what kind of demographics are they self-identifying as in their activities? Uh, here's a brief anecdote about a, a high school English teacher I had which is she told us one day, I don't know why she told us this, uh, but she and her husband had had this, this division of chores where she would do everything that involved arms and hands and he would do everything that involved legs. So he would vacuum and mow the lawn and, and do other walky aroundy things and she would do the dishes and she would cook. This broke down as soon as they had children um, because that meant, A, one thing is she had to change all the diapers, which it turns out is one of the greatest causes of marital strife and divorce among couples with children is when one person changes a disproportionate number of diapers. Um, but also, if you had a kid on the floor, then suddenly what did you do? Because you would have to bend down to pick the child up, which is a leg-based activity. But picking up the child themselves is a hand-based activity. <laughs> Um, so here's a paper uh, I couldn't actually read because it was behind a paywall, so please open access everything. Um, this is by Rebecca Horn. It got some press uh, in, I think, mid-2017. Um, it 
looked at the labor division of household chores among heterosexual married couples in, I believe, Ottawa. Um, so it's, it's a narrow field, and we have to take it with a grain of salt. So we know something about one particular group of Canadians. Um, however, so I couldn't read it, but I could read the abstract. And there are some really interesting things in the abstract. Um, the, so, so this is a quote. The relative resource perspective was supported during the transition to adulthood and in midlife. What this translates to in normal language is that how much somebody was working affected how many chores they did. Resource perspective, or uh, uh, resource perspective is what kinds of resources are you bringing into your relationship, uh, which really translates to how much money are you bringing in. Um, and from that, the person who was generating more money was actually generally doing fewer chores. Um, and then there was another thing about the time availability perspective, uh, which was supported in young adulthood and midlife. And what this one means is that how much time you had well, had a greater effect during young adulthood and in midlife, as opposed to how much money you were bringing in uh, during the transition to adulthood and midlife. Uh, and most importantly, certain elements of the gender constructivist uh, constructionist perspective were supported in all life stages. So when people thought something was man's work, men would do it. When people thought something was women's work, women would do it. Results indicated that women perform more household work than men at all ages. Right? So in some ages, how much money you made mattered. In some ages, how much time you had mattered. But across everything, whether or not you were a woman or a man mattered the most. Um, so this was a thing that I could read, which is also by Rebecca Horn. Uh, which talked a little bit more about some specifics of the chores people were uh, doing. Um, I'm going to publish these online if you want to click on the URLs later, because they're very long. Um, uh, women consistently performed more housework than men do. Uh, and patterns of housework tend to be consistent at each life stage. So this was her explicitly explaining the thing that I assumed from her uh, abstract. Um, and now, this is great. Right? Work hours and raising children for men only come into play among 32-year-olds, reducing the amount of housework involvement. Um, what this says to me is that as soon as children show up, men do less housework. What does that mean with that housework? It means a woman starts to do that housework. So as soon as a child is involved, suddenly men have this excuse to like, not be participating in chores, and women are expected to pick up that slack. Uh, so I was talking to someone uh, about the involvement of women in free software, specifically at events, because he was, he was planning an event. And he asked me about representation uh, and like, you know, what kinds of things are going on to get people in the room. Um, so I, I asked him what happens once people have children, because he noticed that there was a drop off between you know, students and, and like, you know, female students, women who are students showing up, and then women past those life stages, women who were married and women who had kids. And I said, so what happens when someone has kids? He's like, well, um, maybe their husband could watch the kids when that happens. Uh, and this is an anecdote point, which is many of the women I know in tech who are married to men uh, their, the, their husbands are also in some capacity in tech, especially in cases of free software. Um, so I would really like to see how that plays out. If anyone wants to share personal anecdotes, that would be cool. Uh, not right now, though. <laughs> um, so, this is like, so this is what free software was doing. This is what volunteer communities are doing. Uh, and I wanted to know now, in comparison, a little bit about what companies were doing. Because companies have to deal with things like anti-discrimination policies, whereas uh, in a uh, free software community that's maybe making uh, like some part of an operating, people who are working on the Linux kernel uh, historically have been allowed to be more sexist in some of the language used on the list. I have another talk about this actually and how they are doing better. Um, so yay Linux kernel community. Um, so Microsoft and other companies have very different kinds of restrictions on what they can do. Uh, so one thing that came out of Microsoft was that 29.1% of its workforce, that, that's the women in their workforce, it was 29.1%. So there are still few, like significantly fewer women working at Microsoft than men. Uh, but they were still actually there in much higher numbers than they were in free software projects, at least in respondents to free soft, two surveys about free software projects. Um, of that number, 16.6% .6 work in technical positions, and 23% hold leadership roles. Women uh, 
at Microsoft, there are fewer of them doing technical work than there are women doing leadership work. A lot of leadership work carries administrative labor along with it. Uh, Deb Nicholson has a lot of things to say about the gender division of labor and the age division of labor at tech companies. Um, she and I gave a talk, Shameless Self-Promotion, uh, about ageism in technology called All Ages, How to Build a Movement. Uh, there are some videos of that online if you want to know more about it, or you could email Deb. Uh, Twitter, on the other hand, uh, had 10%, women filled 10% of its technical jobs, and 21% of the women there were in leadership positions. I didn't find like a hard, easy percentage uh, for how many women were in the company as opposed to men. Uh, and then we have Google, where 17% of the search giants' tech jobs were women, and 21% of them manage others. Uh, in all of these cases, across all of these companies, we are seeing more women in leadership roles, which in some ways you might say is good, but it also probably means that they're not able to be in, lead in technical positions. Um, this is a statement about the concept of women's work versus men's work, and it's the separation between technical labor and non-technical labor. Even the language that they were using, they specified leadership versus technical. They didn't specify like divisions of leadership and other things that talked about non-technical labor. They don't like give this idea that there's more to non-technical labor than just not being technical. Um, so this is also an idea of what kinds of work and responsibilities are attributed to age. Generally, if you're in a leadership position, you've been around longer. So you're seeing more women who are older not in doing technical labor and instead doing that kind of administrative labor. Um, so from the surveys, uh, this was uh, with GitHub because it had the most robust data set uh, and therefore was the, both the hardest to work with but the easiest to get interesting results from. Um, uh, most people there never made administrative contributions. Um, the way that GitHub had classified this as their optional categories included like a, a, an actually quite extensive list of varying types of technical co uh, contributions. And then things like you write documentation, you do administrative tax, you ta tasks, you plan events. Um, so most of the people who responded to the GitHub survey never do any kind of non-technical labor. Um, and they never do any kind of administrative labor. Uh, very unsurprisingly, a very small percentage of people, the smallest of the groups, uh, frequently perform administrative tasks. Um, here's a breakdown by gender. Okay, so the red, this, I realize this is a really bad graph, I'm really sorry guys. Um, so the red is the total uh, percentage of people who identified as that gender from within the context of the whole. Um, the blue set, the blue bar is how many people among the set of those who make community administrative contributions are broken down by gender from within the set of people making community administrative contributions. I'm sorry, that's very complicated to say. Um, uh, so you have to start out from understanding that there are a lot more men than women overall in the community. Um, and then you have to understand that uh, there, that the percentage of, of men within the set of people who are making it administrative contributions is lower than the total percentage of men. So what that means is while you'll have a larger number of men making these contributions, the percentage of them is lower than the percentage of women making these contributions. Um, in fact, uh, it turns out that women make a disproportionate number um, of administrative, do they do a disproportionate amount of administrative work. Um, it turns out that non-binary individuals do a lot of uh, administrative work. And then there's this category of people who preferred not to identify their gender. Uh, so we don't really know what fits in there and we respect their decision to do so. Um, uh, so this is the same thing by age. Um, you're seeing there's this big jump between people under the age of 35 and people over the age of 35. Administrative tasks are done by people who are older than 35. Uh, just think about that. Um, and that is actually kind of the same thing that you see reflected in companies overall, where you're seeing more administrative work and more leadership work and more of that kind of gritty stuff and less technical work being handled by older people. Um, so, of the GitHub survey, there were 23 respondents out of uh, approximately 6,030, okay, 23 of 6,030, who make no coding contributions. Not no technical contributions, no coding contributions, right? Nine of them identified as men, three identified as women, two were non-binary, and eight declined to answer. Um, so that's, a, that's like a very small set that we have to work with here, but it's kind of convenient because there aren't a lot of them, so we can look at them all. 
uh, code contributions by gender. Uh, this was an uh, overall kind of analysis of the uh, GitHub survey, just kind of looking at who was doing technical contributions uh, either instead of or in addition to non-technical contributions. Um, it turns out that almost every man who participates in a project on GitHub and responded to this survey does technical work. Um, and it also turns out actually that uh, among the women who are doing non-technical labor, most of them uh, are among the women, most of them are doing non-technical labor as well as technical labor, uh, which is cool, but also means if we think back at the, at the chart of who was doing non-technical work uh, and who was doing administrative work specifically, you're seeing a disproportionate amount of women doing wor work there. So maybe women are just working harder than men? Um, so then I wanted to know how political organizing compared. I know a lot of people who do political organizing. I think of those as open contribution communities in the same way that I think about free software projects as open contribution communities, in that the bar to entry is to show up. And as soon as you show up, you can start stacking chairs. Stacking chairs means you can start helping out doing menial tasks that no one else wants to do. Um, so I surveyed some people I knew who, the, the, you know, I had conversations, I interviewed some people I knew who were involved in political organizing in the greater Boston area. Um, and here are some things that they told me, one of which is that women are a minority among active members for one particular organization. Uh, about 36% were women and 58% were men. Um, they said that this was, like, this exact, these exact numbers came from the Facebook group, but the next few meetings they went to, they kind of, like, looked at, like, okay, this is, this seems reflective of the Facebook numbers. Um, uh, and then the same person said that the four people who do the most administrative work, two of them are young women, one is a queer disabled man and one is a senior man. Uh, so while you're seeing a, an arguably split division of labor by gender, and I think that's a very generous thing to say because that is putting a queer disabled man into a category in which they may or may not be comfortable, I don't really know. Um, because I don't know the person. Um, there are also certain roles that are filled only by women um, uh, in leadership positions. And then there were some that were mainly by men. Uh, it turns out that in the tech working group, it was mostly men doing leadership, and that in things that were more administratively based overall, you had more women taking on those roles. Um, the feminist working group was all women and non-binary individuals. Um, steering committees, this was true for multiple organizations, um, of multiple political organizations in the Boston area where they had requirements. Um, in one case, it had to be about 50% men and about 50% women uh, participating in leaders, like in that overall high level leadership positions. Um, and then other groups had quotas like no more than 50% men. Um, uh, so this was kind of looking at, we're going to create policies in the same way that uh, companies are creating policies and working from. Uh, it turns out that once you have policies about who's allowed to be in charge and who's allowed to do what kind of work, you're seeing a lot more gender parity. Uh, so what are some conclusions that we can pull from this whole thing? Uh, one question I really wanted to ask ourselves is, have we been doing better? This chart uh, claims that we are doing better by age, but it doesn't actually say anything about whether new people are showing up, right? Free software we think of as, in general, being ageist, and tech is ageist, and I think that's true, right? But, is it, but at the same time, we're seeing communities getting older. Um, and we have these ideas that there are a lot of young people, that there are a lot of students, that you know, hacking and free software is this like game for children. Um, and that's not really the case, but is that not the case because uh, we're forming more welcoming spaces for people who've never coded before. Are we forming more welcoming spaces for people who are older, who are just starting to get involved? Or is it just the case that tech is aging, uh, that free software is aging? Um, and then there's the same question for gender. Like, are we doing better? Uh, that's a very good question. The numbers kind of imply we are doing better. Uh, I don't know how true that is because surveys aren't really good, right? Uh, this alone demonstrates how surveys really aren't that good. Um, and so I like to think that in spite of the fact when we have survey results, we very rarely have more than 90 per, like I can't actually think of any time I saw more than 90% women other than the 2013 survey. Uh, the 90% number comes from various reports people have kind of given about various communities. Uh, a lot of those do come from the same sources uh, that just, uh, a lot of them come from the same sources that are saying, you know, our project is less than 90% women or our event has like, we reached 80% women attendees. Isn't that the best? 
Um, it turns out 20% women attendees and 20% women speakers are considered admirable and laudable numbers. Um, admirable and laudable were uh, specific words used in one particular article on the matter. Um, uh, so, but actually, so it turns out that there probably are some more women involved than, you know, 92%, 92% men, 98% men, um, but we don't really know that and we're not really going to know that until we do better survey work and we have better response rates. And one of the best things we can do for that is looking at and asking into like specific isolated groups where we have an idea of how many people we would like to be responding to it. Um, Oh, also, Outreachy has more alum than all of these numbers, all of the numbers of women combined, I believe, and that includes counting the GNOME Outreach program for women. Um, are companies doing better than us? This is a very good question. And the answer is yes. Companies are doing better than we are. Like, if you're a community of technical labor within a, like a paid organization, uh, these are the large companies that have a lot more HR processes and HR overhead than we'll see in like startups, for example. Startups are abysmal at age uh, diversity and they're abysmal at gender diversity. And they're also abysmal at like every other kind of diversity. <laughs> um, there are a lot of reasons for that. We can talk about those later. Um, so these large companies are doing better than us because they have to respond to these things. We're seeing like just from a numbers perspective, but then, you know, they have complete sets and, uh, of information and they know everybody who's there and they know what those people are doing. Um, so they're kind of doing better. Uh, so what should we do now? Uh, I don't really know what we should do now. That's a very good question. Um, we've been doing lots of things to, for outreach. We've been trying to come up with ways and we've been talking more, right? I recently saw somebody say somewhere um, that they would really like to be seeing more programs to help people who are out of the workforce who aren't working in tech and get involved in tech and get into the workforce in those fields. Um, and I think that's really cool that that's like now a thing people are at least talking about. Um, so maybe we should try acting on those things. Maybe we could try creating uh, more equitable conditions and not just equal conditions by thinking about the places these people are coming from, thinking about the kind of overhead that they need to, the extra kind of overhead that we need to be putting into them, but also the kind of extra work that they need to do just to, just to like get to the same level as your generic uh, contributor between the ages of 21 and 35 uh, who shows up who is probably a man and actually also likely has a college education um, and if you're in Europe is probably married. Um, so there are so many more things that we can talk about in relation to this data, in relation to things we've learned, and in relation to how communities can do better. And we can do that later, and I'm happy to talk about it because I think it's really cool and really interesting. Um, but we're not going to do that right now because we are running low on time. Um, so here are some takeaways. I wanted to spell these out explicitly just to be sure you left knowing the things I wanted you to know. Labor is gender and ageist, right? And this goes from your home to your free software community to your job. Labor is gendered and ageist. Hope you got, got to walk, get to walk away with that. Surveys are really bad. <laughs> They're really, really bad. We can totally do better with surveys. That might be the easiest thing to do better with here, right? Um, so when we're looking at numbers and whenever we read an article talking about the numbers of contributors or talking about anything numeric with a free software project, short of contributions themselves that we can pull the data from and analyze because that is like, that is marked. Um, that is also gendered and ageist and focused on technical contributions because those are the easiest to measure. Um, so take all of those also with a grain of salt when they're talking about how many people are participating um, and like how successful a project is when we're using the metric of like how many technical contribute, how many commits even, right? I make like 30 commits a day when editing a single text file because I'm scared they will get lost somewhere. Um, and we need to do better, right? Uh, even if the numbers imply that we are doing better, we're still doing abysmally, right? That does not reflect what our community should look like. That does not reflect what like the world looks like that does not reflect what education should look like or in cases what education does look like because there is a huge drop off of women who are studying technology versus women who work in the technology field after they graduate um 
So that, that was it. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks, as I do at the end of all of my talks. I'd really like to thank the LCA organizers um, for inviting me here and for uh, inviting all of you here and putting together this great conference. Um, the Free Software Foundation, that's the nonprofit I work for. We are powered by our members um, and small donors. And because people are supporting the FSF, that means I get to come here and talk about things that I think are really interesting. Um, and then I get to spend my time thinking and talking about free software every day, which makes me super happy. Um, the Open Source Initiative is another great org I'd like to thank. Um, the Software Freedom Conservancy has done a lot of work that has supported the building of diversity uh, in free and open source software, and I deeply appreciate that. Um, all the survey respondents, um, and I'd also like to thank those of you who ran surveys, even though I just criticized your surveys a lot, um, because I think as time went on, you were doing better. Um, and I think you're going to keep doing better. And I'd like to thank everyone else who contributes to free software for everything you do. Uh, and here's a picture of my cat if you have any questions, or just want to look at my cat. <laughs> Uh, I heard, yes, What's your my cat is named Bash. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, if anyone else has questions, um, I think it's really great if there's anyone in the room who's never asked a question before, or anyone in the room who identifies as a woman or identifies on a gender not on the binary spectrum, I would really love if you wanted to ask a question first. Um, and then I'm happy to open the floor. It's cool if you have no questions, too. And if you're scared to ask a question in a big room, it's not that scary, it turns out. It's like fun. You get to hear yourself on the mic. <laughs> OK, then. Well, oh, oh yeah. I do have a question. Yes. Um, so having said that surveys are terrible, mm -hmm. Uh, a great question, which was, should I move this way or should I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's a great question, which is how can we be doing better with survey work and what kinds of things can people be doing, or at least what do I think they can be doing? Um, while I have conducted surveys, I am in no way trained in survey work uh, or sociology or statistics. Um, but I did talk to a sociologist <laughs> about surveys and how bad they are. Um, and the kinds of things that we can be doing, one of the biggest things is by looking at closed sets. Um, by thinking about how many people we're asking, who those people are, why we're asking them, and then measuring what percentage of them respond. Uh, and that's one of the biggest things we can do. Uh, a lot of the surveys, I believe, do an abysmal job at looking at age demographics, at looking at gender demographics, at looking at other ways that people uh, are identifying themselves and instead trying to fit them into molds. Um, there was uh, an article somebody wrote on this about the GitHub survey. So if you search for like GitHub survey, like gender criticism um, or something like that, you'll, you'll get some good results. Um, uh, thinking more about how labor is divided, thinking about it as technical or non-technical, creating some more uh, this is really annoying if you're looking at raw data, but having open boxes and open like, response fields is how you're going to be getting a much better idea of what's actually true from people. Um, I know this is really bad in front of all my talk on this. I didn't fill out the GitHub survey, um, though I did read it at multiple stages of its developmental process. Uh, uh, and I, th I feel like part of that was when I looked at it, I felt like it was geared entirely towards technical contributors to GitHub and that there was nowhere for me to really answer. And looking at the raw data, uh, it also kind of felt reflected in that way. Like it was very coding focused, which GitHub is. And they're writing a survey and they're talking about their survey as a free, free and open source software survey. Um, wow, I saw two more hands go up or three. Oh, that's so great. Um, but, but so not having required questions, I think, is also really important because that can deter people from finishing or from starting if they have to answer a lot of things before they finish. Um, I saw three hands. I see Karen's still up. Uh, would the FSF consider running a campaign around this? Would the FSF consider running a campaign around a survey? No, not oh, around no, no. a survey, <laughs> around this issue and raising awareness. Uh, of raising awareness Labor. for the division of labor. I. Don't know. Um, I think you should talk to John Sullivan about that, uh, who is also at this conference. Everyone should go talk to John Sullivan about that, who's also at this conference. Um, one of the things that uh, some groups do and other groups don't do so well is thinking about who's making free software and what makes free software run. Um, and I think that at a high level, 
uh, when we're looking at free so uh, foundations working in the free and open source software space, that's a thing that we should be talking about more, is helping people who are actually trying to make it. Uh, then I saw Donna's hand. This was awesome. Oh, thank you. Uh, a lot, you, you sort of broke that thing down in terms of numbers. Yeah. Did you do any looking at how the various categories are valued? So the value of technical versus non-technical versus administrative versus leadership type level? So, no, I didn't. Um, that wasn't reflected in this, uh, in like the data sets I had. Um, uh, how the, the question was about, um, uh, how labor is valued or how uh, like age contribution, like contributors by age are valued in projects. Um, the, uh, so I don't know, um, this wasn't included, but, but I have some anecdote about it. Um, and one of my favorite things is when people say, oh, you know, I help run the conference, but I also do this coding thing or, you know, I, uh, you know, I edit the newsletter, but I also maintain this package. Um, and the use of the term but really emphasizes that it's the second half of the sentence that's more important. Um, so people who are doing multiple kinds of things frequently at least seem to feel the need to justify their existence within a community by insisting or adding that they're also doing technical labor in addition to anything else. Yes. Um, what are my insights? Into what, what <laughs> okay, what, what have I found? That's, that's way more useful. What have I found about startups and diversity and that makes them particularly bad? Um, the culture is what it frequently comes down to. Uh, I, when I worked at a startup, um, it was a small group of people. We worked out of like effectively the first floor of someone's house. Um, the hours were really weird. Um, so being there required a lot of compromises that you wouldn't have in like a more traditional office. Um, there was a, a perspective written by a guy, um, I could probably find it if I like looked for all the right search terms. He explained that when he was working at a large company, he uh, like as a programmer, he found that it was the most diverse team he ever worked on. Um, but when he was working at a startup, the culture was all around, oh yeah, well we're gonna work all day, and then we're gonna go out for beer, and then we're gonna, and it's gonna be fancy microbrew beer that costs a lot of money, and then we're gonna go back to the office and work some more. Um, so that suddenly means if you have kids, you're like, not only can you not do the same kind of work to keep up, um, but you also just like can't participate in all the cultural activities. So. No, um, I think uh, uh, the other surveys I looked at, the question was, um, did surveys include the kind of data questions that GitHub had around uh, sexual identity? Um, and I didn't really see that. Uh, I did see one of, the, one of the first two, I think it was the one from Asterix, uh, did ask about whether people were married. Um, and that attempted to glean whether or not having a partner affected your ability to contribute either by having more time to do so or less time to do so. Um, but while GitHub did ask those questions, I, like nobody else did. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. I heard anecdotally that uh, in China and in Indonesia, there's a much more close gender amongst developers. Oh. So has my research looked outside of the Anglosphere of demographics? Uh, no, because my research was entirely based on other people's research. Um, uh, surveys, uh, I believe all of the surveys did include questions about the location people were uh, in some capacity. They often, I think they all included questions of national identity. Um, I know the Debian survey asked where you were from like where, where you were born and where you are living now. Um, one of kind of the, the little things I was curious about that was how much geographic uh, flexibility people had. Um, but I didn't take that into account for this at all. Any other questions? 
cool. Well, thank you.